Bonjour à tous. Donc, cette conférence a lieu dans le cadre euh, du programme public des Beaux-Arts de Paris. Et je suis ravie d'être avec vous ce soir. Donc, je suis Estelle Zong-Mengual, je suis euh, responsable de la chaire Habiter le paysage, l'art à la rencontre du vivant. Euh, et dans le cadre de cette chaire, donc, il y a régulièrement des conférences publiques qui euh, essayent de, de traiter euh, ce qu'on essaye de porter avec cette chaire ici à l'École des Beaux-Arts de Paris à savoir euh, comment euh, accorder de l'importance au monde vivant dans la création, comment la création peut permettre euh, d'enrichir, de, de créer de nouvelles relations au monde vivant euh, et euh, quels sont, voilà, que c'est pour ça que c'est très intéressant pour nous aujourd'hui d'avoir euh, avec nous un artiste, Marcus Coates, euh, qui euh, toute sa carrière a a pris à bras le corps cette question. Euh, je vais parler en anglais maintenant pour que euh, Marcus puisse comprendre ce qu'il se dit. Donc la conférence va avoir lieu en anglais, euh, mais ensuite vous pourrez bien sûr poser des questions en français si vous vous sentez plus à l'aise et je traduirai euh, les questions. So it's a delight really and an honor to have you here with us today. Um, And I'm a bit emotional, really, because uh, Marcus has been for a long time one of uh, an artist I've been working on for at least 10 years, I think, which is a huge amount of time when you think about it. Um, and uh, I've always considered, it, considered him uh, one of the most uh, important artists today. Um, He, his work is kind of impossible to describe and summarize so, um, because the body of work is immense. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is uh, going to tell you in a few words why I think his work is uh, very special and important. Um, so he's been working with all kinds of mediums, really, from videos to photography, performance, installation, sculpture, I could go on for a while. Um, and if the work is so diverse, it's because one of the, I think, one of the concerns at the heart of uh, Marcus' work is how uh, we humans, with all our abilities, with all our ability to create and invent, and also with our all limitations, can uh, form a relationships, uh, form relationships with more than human living forms. And um, when, this is at, when this is at, your, at the heart of your, of your work, you have to try and choose different mediums every time because the problem is how you're going to approach uh, Uh, another perspective on life that is another life form. So you have to be constantly varying strategies and um, means of translating the perspectives of others. Um, and that's also what, what is so beautiful in Marcus's work is uh, that he's consistently Uh, returning to the task, the impossible but beautiful task of uh, becoming for one short moment in time, maybe, for a glimpse in time, uh, another living form, another being, knowing that it can't be attainable, maybe, but while doing it, Uh, we're learning so much about who we are as humans and also uh, knowing a lot better who uh, all these alterities in front of us are also. So his work is really about, uh, into my mind of course, is really about uh, trying and trying again to invent forms of translation, of relating, of uh, 
get, getting acquainted also with uh, other life forms. And um, it's really a, a wonderful body of work uh, that to, to every work is, is really interesting, but also to see the evolution of your work and reading it um, and seeing it as a totality is also really, really telling about what you're in, uh, trying to do uh, as an artist. So I think there's, uh, as, as we were talking, talking about earlier, there is a, a thread going, on, going with, through all your works, even if uh, they take very different forms and shapes. And, so yes, I'm really glad um, that you are all able to meet him and hear him because he's not often in France also, so it's really a privilege for us to have him here today. And yes, I will give you the floor now. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you, Esther. Um, it, it feels like you've done the talk. <laughs> not really. <laughs> not much more to say. <laughs> So yeah, it's a very lovely introduction and it's, it's lovely to be here in Paris and at the Beaux-Arts. It's um, amazing, really. I, I went to art college um, in a similar place in London at the Royal Academy. Uh, I say similar, it's, um, it's, it's a big gallery, really, and there's a small art school at the back, but it has that, uh, that sense of history. And I, I know what that is to uh, be with as a student. It's, it's not easy to make work with all this history. Um, <clears throat> but it's an interesting proposition um, and uh, a great privilege, I know, to do that. So yeah, um, <clears throat> maybe, you know, I, maybe I should start with being a student. Um, uh, yeah, I did nine years of art education and uh, I was telling the students earlier that after nine years, I didn't really feel equipped to be an artist. I, didn't, I wasn't ready to be an artist after nine years. Um, I think, what, what, what more do I need to know? What more do I need to learn to be an artist? So, I, um, after that, I, I had a studio in London and I made work and I had a gallery in London and I was selling work. But I really uh, got very, very stuck. I got very, very st stuck with the idea of being an artist and what that meant. I got very, um, I found the, the idea of going into the studio and making art as a purpose very difficult. <clears throat> the, the, the idea of making art itself felt uh, in some way impotent or redundant to me. Um, it didn't feel like that was the purpose. Maybe if I related to the world then and explored that and and that manif manifested in something, maybe I could call that art after that. But to go out and create art as an initial purpose, that started to feel uh, like it was a barrier to me. So I've stopped making art and I moved to the countryside uh, near Wales. And, and it's a very, it's a farming area. It's a very beautiful area. And I became a, I started being a builder. I started making houses and um, working on the building sites, working with bricks, uh, building walls. Um, and it's very, very uh, physical, physical work. And in my time away from that, I was going into the woods and in the fields and doing what I love, which is um, looking at animals and birds. And this was almost always my passion. Wildlife was almost always my passion. But in my 20s, I really returned to it. It was once I gave up art, um, all these other interests that I pushed to the side for art came up. And I started unconsciously making performances in nature. So I'd go in the woods and I'd just stand in the woods and listen. I'd uh, go in a field and just sit in the field and think about who I was uh, as a lone human in comparison to everything around me. How am I to define myself as a human in terms of the living things around me? What do I have at my disposal? What tools do I have at my disposal 
to decide who I am, as opposed to the grass, to the trees, to the sky, to the fox, to the worm. Who am I compared to them? And this became a, a, a problem for me, a problem I wanted to solve. I think I already had the intention of being closer to nature. You know, we all understand that. We want the connection. But it wasn't um, necessarily how I can connect, but um, maybe what's stopping me connecting. So I looked at all the culture I had and the culture that I was born with and, and grew up with, the science. I can understand the tree because it's um, a plant organism and it's cellular and maybe I'm cellular and there are levels of comparison between me and this tree. I can understand nature in a romantic way. Uh, this is a beautiful picture. It has aesthetic value. It's, it's picturesque. Um, I should value it because of that. And lots of these, these um, filters or these modes of culture had at their heart uh, a, a, a way of valuing uh, nature. And it seems like the exchange or the comparison or the relational um, tool was to do with worth, was to do with value. And, um, and then I started to think about the market economy, supply and demand, rarity and, and scarcity, how these are valued, and how I want to see a rare bird, how I want to see a, 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 a stoat, a rare mammal. And why do I want to see a rare thing? Is it because the market economy values rare things? Or did the market, market economy um, ride on the back of something that's innate in us as humans, that we, we value the, 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 the rare things? Um, so yeah, it, it became very confusing. I didn't know um, where uh, I began and, and nature, uh, where, where, where I finished and nature began, where nature began and I finished. It was this boundary. Uh, my culture wasn't helping me uh, understand this boundary. And I knew this boundary was fluid. It's not a fixed wall. I knew that if I look at the tree and, it, and if I stand up, the, the, the tree is vertical. I am vertical. Um, if I see, um, if I see um, a fox walk across the field, it's walking. I, 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 can, I can walk along with it. There are, are levels of comparison, even if they are physical, that I know the fox is experiencing movement, is experiencing motion. It has the intention of walking forward. I have the intention of walking forward. It might be for different purposes, but we both have intentionality. So on these very basic um, um, comparisons, I found like there, there is, the wall is down. I can start to understand the experiences, I can understand the perspectives to some degree of others, of the living things around me. And this even came down to uh, looking at uh, um, birds and bats, all sorts of species, and thinking they feel temperature, they experience light, and plants, they feel temperature and light. Um, <clears throat> They, have, they need food, they need nutrients, they live off the soil and the sun, we do the same. So that there, was, there was so much in common between me and these things around me and these beings, more in common maybe than we had different. So that became a kind of um, an area I really wanted to explore. But how to explore this and how to explore the, the degrees. <clears throat> so I set myself an extreme task. Okay, and let's push this to an extreme. And this is sometimes a useful strategy, I think, thinking about your practice as an artist. What if I take it to the furthest point? What if I take the argument to the very end? What if I was a bird? What if I became a bird? Now, of course, that is uh, 
futile and crazy and silly. Yeah. But what I started to do when I, I was on my own a lot and I thought, okay, there's no one watching, I'm in a field, I could become a bird. And if I become a bird and act like a bird, does that allow me to see like a bird? Does that give me knowledge of um, uh, other physicality and the physicality that might um, um, also affect um, sensation and perception and awareness, um, um, even emotion maybe. So this, this became quite an important part. And so I started doing that. I started acting like animals. I'd go in the field and I'd walk around on my hands and knees, being a fox. Or I'd, um, I'd sit on a, a fence post where I know birds sit, and I'd just sit there for a very long time, like I know birds sit there for a very long time. And just being in the motion and in the time scale of, of what the birds and the animals were doing <clears throat> um, gave me um, material to, to work with. It gave me a sense of maybe I am sharing some subjective um, experience that the bird does. Maybe I, I am sharing a subjective world that the fox does. Objectively, I'm still a human, but subjectively, perhaps there is some shared consciousness. <clears throat> so this is one of the first, um, I suppose, um, re um, documentations of these performances I did. So I, I started to think that I, I would like to look at myself being a bird. I want to prove to myself that I, I am a bird perhaps, or I'm not a bird. Where have I failed or where have I achieved this, this transition into this other species? So I asked these lumberjacks in this forest, and this was in Grisdale in the northeast of England. I asked them to um, help me climb up this tree and fix me with a harness. So this is a close-up. And they put a big ladder up this tree and they, a, a winch, and they pulled me up. And I fixed this, this harness around me. And they pulled the ladder down and then they went off for their breakfast <laughs> in their car. And they didn't come back for two hours. So I was in this tree and it was really windy and I was moving around. And I could see the whole forest around me. It's a really tall tree. And there was a photographer about a really long way away, maybe um, half a kilometre away. And she was taking pictures of me because I wanted this, this, this evidence of me being this bird. Um, and there was something about this experience of being up in this tree and, and, and seeing through the eyes of maybe the world as a bird sees the world, feeling the wind, feeling this motion, feeling the sense that um, this is big commonality here between my experience and the bird's experience. But looking at the photograph, I cannot escape my, my humanness. I cannot escape the fact that I'm strapped to this tree and I can't fly away and <clears throat> there's, there's so much that we don't share. So for me, although it's, it was a futile attempt, the attempt to become a bird opened up degrees of shared consciousness or degrees of commonality. And it was that that was important. And that attempt was a thing that I felt culture in some way wasn't allowing me to do. And that became the, the important strategy, the trying, not the achieving. So this, this, this physicality became quite important because I think the physicality in a way was outside of thought. It was unconscious, it was, it was a shared, a shared um, sense of being, really, in the broader sense. This is a, a, a skylark, and the skylark is um, a, a quite iconic bird in England. Um, and you, you probably know the skylark. It's, um, it flies very high, and unusually for birds, it flies and it sings. And that takes an enormous amount of effort and energy to do that. It's, it's, um, it's unbelievable how it does that. 
And it's so brave. I mean, if a bird of prey or an eagle will come up, it will fly higher and higher and higher and keep singing. And it's singing to define its territory and it's singing to attract a mate. Um, and I think it's singing because it, it can as well. And the, the song of the skylark is, is amazing. I'll just, um, if I can find it actually. <clears throat> So sometimes they can sing for 20 minutes like this, constantly. So they sing, never repeating a phrase. Um, it's, it's one ornithologist uh, studied the Skylark song and it had over, they, they counted over 2000 phrases. So within one song for 20 minutes, they don't repeat a phrase and they don't ever hesitate. There's no gaps. There's no, oh, I don't know what to sing next. It's just constant. And it's constant invention and it's constant creativity. And I just thought how, and I, I sort of um, think of myself as a creative person and an imaginative person. How does the Skylark do that? It's almost like this stream of consciousness. So I, I, um, I sort of developed this, this, not developed, but I, I wanted to test myself. Maybe I could um, um, embody the Skylark's mentality. So I'm just going to do um, a short performance for you. Now, bear in mind that I'm trying to um, make sound without repeating and without hesitating. should go on and on and on and on for minutes and minutes. <laughs> so what I, um, what I feel like in this attempt, I'm, I'm not becoming the Skylark, but there is a certain sense of that I'm learning something. And I'm maybe learning something about the Skylark, but more uh, importantly, I'm learning something about my own ability to create and be creative and how, in a sense, I am not able to think. I am not able to consciously have control over the next sound. The sound must be um, created by the preceding sound. So when I make a sound, then where do I go from there? Well, decides. I don't decide, is the brain. So in a way, the body becomes the brain and the body becomes the consciousness and the body becomes the thinking and the movement and the sound becomes the imagination. And that's, um, that's quite liberating. I mean, it's like dancing in a way. You, you, you don't think about what you're doing next, but it's liberating in that that's maybe a form of knowledge. That's maybe a form of understanding that's, that's, that's important in this sense.
So it's, it's not all about me, obviously, but I, I, I started the, using myself really as, a, um, as, as an experiment, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, first person research. And then I thought, okay, well, what, where's this interesting in, in society? Well, what's, what's, what's the link beyond this into, into a wider world for other people? And so I, I got very interested in the dawn chorus. And the dawn chorus is um, when birds vocalize, they sing in the morning, in springtime, as the sun's coming up. And it's a crazy frenzy of birdsong. It's just, it's like a madness. And you, you all know it, I'm sure. But if you stand in a dawn chorus, it's, the intensity of it is, um, it kind of blows your mind a bit. And you wonder, well, I wonder, what are the birds doing? Why are they doing this? It's, it's so intense. Where does this, where does this happen in, in, human, in the human world? But um, the idea of the, this, this sort of social gathering of birdsong and all these different species doing it at the same time and the, the necessity and the urgency around it really captivated me. So... Um, <clears throat> I, I, I asked this quite well-known birdsong recordist, he's a wildlife sound recordist, Jeff Sample in England. He's quite well known for his amazing recordings of wildlife. I asked him to help me to record a dawn chorus, but we did it with 14 microphones positioned in the woodland where we knew the birds were going to sing. And this was a big operation. It was very difficult technically to do this. But we spent uh, maybe two weeks in a, in a caravan um, in the dark, listening to all these birds. And he is amazing at listening to birds because maybe we have three blackbirds singing. Uh, we have one blackbird on microphone one, we have a blackbird on microphone four, and we have a blackbird on microphone 10. And Jeff and me are sitting in the caravan listening to the, the blackbirds. He's saying, oh, blackbird C, like that's the third blackbird, moved to microphone five and it's dark outside. I said, how do you know it's, it's black, blackbird C, the third blackbird? He said, I know that song now. They all, have, they all have their signature song. They are individuals. And this was amazing to me that not only could he tell which species was which through their song, but he could tell individuals amongst one species. So this, this opened my mind into the idea of the individual as well, um, and how we see nature or how I was seeing nature. In this landscape picturesque tradition, we abstract. We say, this is, this is nature. But actually it's a group of individuals so that was quite fascinating. And I, I took these, these recordings of bird songs back to my studio and I slowed them down about 20 times. So when you slow any sound down, you know it gets lower and slower like that. So a, a blackbird song would be That's very bad imitation of a blackbird song. But when you slow that down, it sounds like this. It's very strange and haunting. It's amazing. And where you might hear one note of the bird, like a uh, if you slow it down, there's maybe 20 notes. And that makes up the sound when you speed it up. So it, the slowing down revealed all this, this magic, it revealed all this amazing sort of ancient music um, with this different scale and this different, different structure. So that was fascinating. And then I asked, people, I, I went around lots of choirs in Bristol and I said, do you want to sing like a bird? And I had lots of people coming and I did auditions and um, so people sat in their habitats and they have a little earphone and they're listening to the slowed down bird song 
So he's listening to the slowed down bird song of a yellow hammer. <clears throat> and he listens for two hours and he tries to copy the song. And it's quite easy to follow. So he's going like this. Um, what's the yellow hammer song? It's. Um, and he's doing that over and over again for two hours. Um, and then I take, I film him doing it, and then I take the film and I speed the film up 20 times, or for the same speed I slowed it down. So this is, this is the result of their speeded up song. So they are singing this. She's a wren. It's a wren. Do you know? A uh, rossignol, possible. He's a pheasant. A pheasant. Pheasant. Is a song thrush? Une grève musicienne. So yeah, there were, there were about um, 25 people and in the exhibition there were 14 screens representing 14 microphones and each one had a person singing like a bird on it and they'd swap around and that would copy when the birds moved or when new birds came in. So I didn't just want to show the single individual singing. I wanted it to replicate exactly the timings of the bird song dawn chorus. So it's, it's not just bringing it into the human uh, world, it's, it's a, an exact replication, really, of the dawn chorus with the human voice. Um, so that was kind of taking it to an extreme using a sort of technology, I suppose. But it really unveiled lots of interesting um, uh, connection for me in terms of physiognomy, in terms of the uh, physical capacity. Um, when you sing the song slow down, there are gaps where you breathe. And for these people, when they're singing, they take the same gaps as the, they take the same breaths as the birds. So they are in a way inhabiting the same uh, physical space and timings of the bird. So in that sense, we are like very large birds. <coughs> And we share so much with birds in terms of um, vocal communication. So for me, this is a, a very um, interesting area. So, <clears throat> the, there's the physical aspect, but also I, I became very interested in the cultural aspect. 
Um, in a way, I know I communicate using my breath and my lungs, as, as the birds do, but why am I communicating? What am I doing when I'm singing? Uh, <clears throat> what are the birds doing when they're singing? And I'm also quite interested in football and football culture. And I started to think about um, what the football fans are doing when they're singing. And they're, they're in the stadium and they're, they've got their shirts on and they're showing their colours, their plumage. And they're singing their songs and they're using repetition. They're sing, singing it over and over again, just like the birds do. And they're using phrasing and they're improvising and they're always this, this message that comes across is, we are the best, we are the fittest, we are the strongest. I thought this is, this is quite similar to what the birds are doing. And I think I was always under the impression that the bird song is very beautiful. And of course it is, but there's another side to it. Is it's like a proxy violence or a pretend violence. It's a, it's a threat. Um, and in a way I like that convergence with another species. It's a convergent evolution. We've both evolved methods of being violent without fighting. I'm just going to stop it there because it, it does just go on and on. <laughs> and when I filmed him doing it, he, he just went on for hours and hours. And he was singing, he was singing the songs that he learnt. He was a Chelsea supporter. He was singing the songs he learnt in the 70s. So lots of the songs were very aggressive and they were sexist, they were racist, they were homophobic, and they were, they were, they were pretty, pretty bad and, and kind of unacceptable. And, um, and in this environment, they, they seemed even more tragic because there was no one that he was singing to. The only things coming back to him were the birds. And it really isolated and, and showed me that sort of behavior. <clears throat> um, so yeah, the, 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 the cultural aspect of becoming and becoming other than human, um, I started to look elsewhere into other cultures and, and, and the, the history of my culture as well. Who else was, has done this? Why is this important? Where, where is this necessary? And of course, in, um, in um, folk traditions in Europe, this idea of dressing up as an animal has been very important. But why? What, what, has that, what has that given us? And it's clear if, you, if we look at indigenous societies, the, the purpose and the intent of becoming animal, um, for them often it's this, this notion of the spirit world and it's the belief in the spirit world and as a place to um, inhabit the animal, a place to converse and um, seek information that will help the community. 
So I quite like this idea of becoming animal as a social or political um, um, aid, a, a, a way of becoming a social agent through becoming animal. Fundamentally, you shifting this relationship with nature to help with urban or social problems or political problems. So this is the first project I did in this way. I was staying in this one of these uh, flats in this, in this building in Liverpool in North England and this block of flats was due to be demolished and there were a few people living in it, mainly elderly people, elderly women mainly it seemed. Um, and there were a few artists also who had studios in there and um, one of the artists uh, set up uh, an exhibition of the artist's work and people could come and, and see the things in the flats, um, see her work. So it kind of, it was amazing living in this and being in the same place as the community. And as I got to know the community, it's, um, I became aware of what their worries and concerns were. And I thought, okay, maybe this is, this is the chance Maybe they will allow me to experiment with this becoming animal for them. Maybe I could work on their behalf. And that was the, the, the focus of the work. It was that I was doing this for somebody else and that became quite important. So I arranged to, um, for them all to meet in one of the flats and I said, I'm going to do, you need to ask me a question and I will try and answer that question by becoming animal. And the main way I did that was in my imagination. I closed my eyes and I went to see animals and I talked to them. And I gave this world uh, huge significance, huge importance. This was very real and I had to make sure it was real and I took it very seriously. <clears throat> this was preparation, meeting the people in the flat and that became very important. This is Beryl here. Oh, shoot. Oh, that's annoying. Sorry about that. I need to turn off my Wi-Fi, obviously. I'm just going to get rid of this, actually. I don't know what's happening.
So that went on for about half an hour, about 30 minutes, and I could hear everyone laughing. And um, I thought, that's, that's fine, that's fine. That was, uh, that was okay. And then um, at the end, um, I just sat down and I told them what I'd seen. And I'd seen lots of animals and birds, and I tried to talk to them, but failed mainly. But um, I'd seen this one bird do this very strange thing, and that, that got my interest. So I told them about this, this thing this bird had done. And they were very interested in this, and they, they seemed to give it um, meaning in a way that I haven't given it meaning and importance. And so, in a way, I felt like I was offering a narrative. I was offering a story. And they were using the story to uh, find answers to their question. So that felt quite a, 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 a powerful um, and emotive uh, way of working as an artist. And it felt like a very real way in the sense of, or risky, because I thought they might just tell me to go away. They might tell me to leave. They might think I was being ridiculous or stupid. Um, although I was being very serious. Um, but they didn't reject it, they kind of stayed with it and they were very generous. Um, and this was not a gallery, this is not somewhere where you watch a performance and you are, in that religious way, you are reverent. You, 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 even though it's terrible, you, you allow it to happen and you clap at the end, you know. <laughs> like you do in galleries, but it's, it felt like this was a real test in a way for, for this, this idea of becoming, this idea of me take, learning from other cultures too, um, it felt very important for me. Um, and this was something that I continued to do actually. Um, I went to Israel and I talked to um, some politician there. So I started to make it more and more risky for myself in a way, or put myself in positions where um, there was more at stake. So t t to test this process and my imagination actually in a, in a political sphere that there were, it was, it was very problematic and um, um, there were lots of issues, um, particularly in Israel at that time and, and there still are obviously. So yeah. <clears throat> I was just saying to um, some of the students who are working with today, the idea of being an artist, it's, it's an interesting power because um, people aren't necessarily, people aren't threatened by an artist. It, it does allow you, or allow, has allowed me, uh, the privilege of uh, making work with lots of people. Um, because I think there's a, there's a fascination and an interest and also a, a hunger to do things differently, to try and do things differently. And that's been uh, quite an important thing for me to explore, um, to bring my work into the realms of um, people's lives and make it relevant and try and make it necessary. There's not much time, so I think I might just talk about one other project although I've got millions here to talk to you about. Um, so this, yeah, this is a, a project that's very dear to my heart. Um, and it's, it's, it's language based, so I, I apologize for that. It's, it's all in English, so it's not very visual. But um, this is, I suppose, the idea of becoming um, but it's moving away from this idea of becoming animal or plant or other living being. It is becoming each other. And politically this is problematic. Um, but what, what, I, what I decided to try and do was become someone who's having an experience that felt fundamentally um, uh, different from mine. And of course that exists in all of society. But this particular place was a, uh, a hospice. So it's, you know, a hospice, is that, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So um, everyone in the hospice uh, is terminally ill. 
they're all going to die and they all know they're going to die. And I had a residency organised by, um, it was a project with the Serpentine Gallery and I, I asked if I could go and work at this hospice. So I spent maybe a year going there every week and spending time with people there. And, um, and people said to me, um, what, what, what are you doing here, Marcus? I said, well, I'm an artist in residence. And they say, yeah, what does that mean? We're, we're all dying, what are you doing? I said, well, um, and I sort of didn't know what to say. And it was the first time someone sort of really confronted me with this idea of what is the point of you as an artist? And they ended up saying, to you, so what can you do for us? And I had to really think, and I think okay, well, I'm, I'm, we've got quite a good imagination, and, um, and it was just, it was, didn't feel like enough, because their experiences were so, so precious. They had little time left, and what was I doing messing around with this little time? So in the end, after talking to many people, I, and, and in the end, I just started talking, and they were talking to me, and we were just all in the same room every week. And they kind of accepted me as someone there. And after a while I thought, so many of the conversations I'm having with people who are going to die, it was about, they were asking me to bring information into their worlds, because their worlds were getting smaller, but their imaginations, some of them, their imaginations were staying big. And could I feed this imagination? That's what it felt like. They were using me to give them more information about their world and they wanted to fill in the gaps. So I proposed this idea to many patients. I said, maybe I could be you. Maybe I could be you and I could be vicarious and I could do something that you want to do and come back and tell you about it as you. And they said, no, that's, I need to go, they said. I need to go, not you. And I said, well, you can't go. Maybe I should go and tell you about it. You know, let's, let's try. And so uh, six people came up with ideas for me. And um, it became quite difficult, actually, because families got involved and they didn't want me doing this with them. And it was, it was difficult. But one man's idea, who was named Alex, he was a very interesting man. He had always wanted to go to the Amazon rainforest and he's always wanted to go and meet uh, a community uh, in the Amazon rainforest and he had some questions for them and I said okay well I can go to there the Amazon rainforest and I can ask the questions and I can come back and give you the answers and I can go as you come back as you and you can ask yourself about it or me <coughs> And so this film was made in his hospice room, and this is talking, uh, talking to him before I go anywhere. Okay. I promise you now is to get ready for the And when we're talking now, and, um, if, if this journey goes ahead, it's going to have to be planned relatively soon. Yeah. Um, and I think we need to be honest with each other about the time scales. Yes. And when they're sufficiently. Yeah, I have no idea of my times. Okay. Yeah, but hopefully I'll be able to do the journey and get back to you. I'm relatively quick. I'm not planning anything, but I'm not in complete control. Do you think this journey might be, if I did this for you? Yeah. Might be helpful and beneficial or worthwhile for you. That's hard. Yes, I think it will. But in a very selfish way. That someone who put themselves out there to do it on my behalf. That will be important. That I can relive for seconds or whatever it is, something I've wanted to do. But then, thirdly, will come up 
doesn't matter if I'm not hurt or if I'm going anyway. And I don't want to do that. Does it matter to you? What I hope like that extra experience or something I have in this Does it matter? I don't want to do that. Anyway, it's not going to work to the finality of that world. Of so your life? Exactly. Just another experience? Yeah, because I don't know. I don't know if I don't have anyone can really tell me what experience you carry on with you, provided you carry on with one aspect. So yeah, apologies if that's quite hard to hear and follow. Um, but he's in, in that scene, he's, he's telling me what he wants to do. He, he's given me the instructions. And then I, I leave the hospice and I buy the tickets and I go to Ecuador and I, I hire a guide and I go to see a very remote community in the rainforest. And it takes me about three or four days to get there. And I spend maybe four, four or five days there. And I meet lots of people and ask them the questions he wants to ask. And then I get on the plane and I come home. And as soon as I get back to London, I go and see him in his hospice. And I film me talking to him in the room. And I won't play any of it, but <clears throat> He, he starts asking me about it. He wants to know the information that he wants to know. And I don't show him any pictures and I don't, I don't um, show him any film because he's already gone on this journey in his imagination. He, he knows what he needs to understand. And I don't want him to show him a picture, a photograph and say, no, this is what it is like. He knows already. So I just want to, make that grow. I want to feed that. Um, so he asked me about the river, he asked me about the sounds, he asked me about the people, and are they happy and what do they need and all the stuff he wants to know. Um, so it felt like a, a, a great privilege to be able to do something for him. And he did say, when he was in great pain, I mean, he died a few months after I got back, when he was in great pain, he had somewhere else to go. He had another bend in the river. He had another place to go. Um, he could extend his world out and his fantasy in a way. <clears throat> so that as an artist felt like a, a, an amazing service. So this idea of being useful uh, for the community and in, in a way um, that is perhaps uh, non-rational or uh, it's like bringing this non-rational with the pragmatic together felt um, felt uh, started to feel very important for me and that's the kind of uh, the work that I've continued with um, today really at the moment I'm working with people who have uh, psychosis so um, I am offering to be them and they are directing me to have their experiences. And that's a, a very problematic relationship um, and very difficult ethically, but it's, 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 it's um, turning out to be a very interesting dynamic and a, uh, a kind of life-changing experience for me and the people I'm working with. So we started with becoming animal and now I'm going to becoming each other. So um, yeah, I think that's where I want to leave it. Thanks very much. <clears throat>